right, how's it going everybody? Uh, I am here on Monday, April 5th. Today we're going to talk about section 10.2, Calculus with Parametric Curves. Uh, this is our second topic here in week 11. And section 10.1, all we did was just talk about parametric curves, no calculus. Now that we're comfortable with the concepts associated with parametric curves, we're going to go ahead and hit our parametric curves with all of our calculus concepts. This is basically kind of running through everything we ever want to know about calculus, except instead of having functions like y equals f of x, we're going to have parametric curves. x is f of t, y is g of t. Um, so today is just calculus day with parametric curves. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see how to compute derivatives, find tangent lines, compute inter integrals, therefore find areas, compute arc length, um, which is actually in maybe kind of one of the most interesting things to do. The reason why parametric curves are very interesting is because they can create shapes that do not pass the vertical line test. Um, so arc length, I think, is to me one of the more interesting topics here. And then surface area of a solid of revolution. Uh, if we remember our topics of arc length and surface area of a volume of revolution, we remember that their formulas are very closely related. And so this last topic here won't be um, too exciting after we've already seen the arc length thing. We're just going to plop in our arc length formula into our uh, surface area formula and we'll be all good to wrap up our day with that last topic there so um, let's go ahead and hit it with our calculus with parametric curves so the bottom line is we already know how to do all of these things for equations of the form y equals f of x or x equals f of y all we want to do is just modify our existing ideas to be able to handle parametric equations of the form x equals f of t and y equals g of t. So I'm going to try and keep this f of t and g of t consistent all day here x y in alphabetical order uh, F G also in alphabetical order right there, so hopefully not too terrible, uh, too terribly difficult to remember our our labelings here, our, our function definitions for x and for y in terms of t. Um, and our key in doing all this is just going to be to replace derivatives and differentials based on a single rule. So let's come up with that rule right now. We need to be able to replace things like dx with something that actually now references t. We need to be able to replace x and y with things in terms of t, right? So um, we, we just want to come up with one general like replacement rule, and it's what we're going to use for all of our topics here today. So let's kind of talk through um, doing this guy here. So um, derivatives of, oh wait, uh, 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 uh. oh yeah, sorry. Um, so our derivatives of parametric curves is kind of where we're starting here. So, and this is going to kind of give us our starting off point for the rest of what we're doing here today. Um, what we'd like to know is we'd like to be able to identify the slope of a curve at any location. Slope is still defined as dy dx, but we uh, but we can no longer we no longer necessarily can find an explicit equation for y in terms of x. Man, that was a terrible sentence on my part right there. Um, and the point here is even if it's technically possible to find an explicit formula for y in terms of x, if you can't get it, then you're stuck in parametric land right here. So that's why I've kind of underlined we in that. It's one of those things where some of these things we could like brute force ourselves back into function expressions y equals f of x. Um, but even if you can, did you really do yourself any favors? Think about integrating disgusting quantities. Like that's not necessarily going to be in our best interest here. So we saw I, in our previous video that there are scenarios in which we can explicitly rewrite our parameterization in function form. The easiest example that we did was if x is just t and y is t squared, then y is x squared. That's just a direct uh, sort of solving that system of equations, eliminating the parameter t. So what I want us to do right now is imagine that we could do this for all scenarios. We can't. And it's like definitely can't. Most interesting sets of parametric equations, you cannot condense into one function notation y is a function of x. But imagine that it was possible to do this. Keep that imagination with you for our, our little bit of a derivation right here. Imagine that we could get our x and y into the form, y being some function of x. We're using the letter f here kind of unfortunately, but again the point being that y is just a function of x, that there is no t dependence right there. If that were the case, then what we're interested in finding is dy dx, or the derivative of what we're calling y, capital F, uh, with respect to x. So we would notate that as capital F prime of x right there. So this is what our goal is to find, but again, the important thing for you to remember is we realistically, in most interesting cases, can't act, highlight dang it, can't actually, oh my gosh, oh my, Start from the y, go to the end of the f of x. There we go. In most cases, we can't actually come up with this. But this is still a piece of information that we want to find, <clears throat> even if we can't explicitly find what this capital F function is going to be. So starting from this desired but probably not findable expression right here, equation, 
our goal is to find an expression for capital F prime of X. So I'm gonna just kind of, I've got kind of the derivation sort of written out here, but it needs a little like description next to every single line. So I'm gonna write some things that go along with this. So where are we starting? Well, we're starting with this Y equals F of X, but the thing to sort of remember about this is that we probably can't find this. I'm gonna say probably can't find this, but we want this. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to just go ahead and replace our, our x's and our y's with the functions that we have chosen to represent this. So all I'm saying here is that y we're writing as g of t. This is our parametric equations. And x is f of t, our parametric equations. Now, since our goal is to find capital F of X, or F prime of X, it seems reasonable that we want to go ahead and take a derivative since our goal is to find a derivative. So we want capital F prime of X. So let's take a derivative on both sides. Now, I'm noticing here that since g is a function of t and lowercase f is a function of t, it seems suitable to me to take a derivative with respect to t on both sides. When I go ahead and do this, we just straight up get the derivative on the left. This is the derivative of g of t with respect to t is g prime of t. Nothing fancy happened right here. On the right-hand side, uh, we need the chain rule on the right. So the derivative of a composition of functions is the derivative of the outside function f capital F prime with the inside left alone times the derivative of the inside function with respect to t. So uh, now that we've done this, the good news is that we now have something that looks like capital F prime. But capital F prime of what? Well, it's f of t. Well, what is f of t? Well, that's actually just x. So let's re-replace f of t with x. That's all I did on this line because that's literally how we defined f of t. Oh, what you should notice now is here is that capital F prime of x, which is exactly what our goal was to find. I wanted to know the derivative of y with respect to x, but I wanted it parametrically defined. So it now looks like this thing right here, just by doing a quick little division of lowercase f prime of t to the other side, I've got that capital F prime of x, the desired quantity, seems to just be the individual derivatives of y with respect to t and of f of x with respect to t right here, right? So notice that this is our, our rewritten version of this is saying dy dx. And again, remember, we just said dy dx is capital F prime of x. So f prime of x is dy dx, and that is equal to, well, what's our other way of writing g prime of t? Well, g prime of t is the derivative of y with respect to t. That's dy dt divided by dx dt. So you should notice that this agrees with our function cancellation or fraction cancellation uh, And your thing that I'm going to have yelled at you about many times this semester, I'm going to yell at you again. You cannot, you should not, in general, treat these expressions as fractions. That's not an appropriate usage of the derivative operator. However, this notation was chosen as the derivative operator to look like a fraction because in many, many cases, uh, it does pan out to be equivalent to what we would do if these were algebraic fractions right here. So if this were an algebraic fraction, a over b divided by c over b, the divided by b's would cancel and we would get a over c, which is exactly what we're looking at right here. Remember that they're not actually fractions and you shouldn't trust that you can always do that, but it does work out like that in lots of cases. That's why this was the notation that was chosen for derivatives here. Um, so now that we have this way of determining what is the slope of a curve, right? We've got our dy dx, the slope of a curve at some location x, but we have a, a representation for it now in terms of our parametric functions. Let's go ahead and use this to come up with some kind of like interesting observations that we can see about some parametric curves. So here is a parametric curve, x of t equals t squared, y of t equals t cubed minus 3t. 
and this curve actually intersects itself at a location 3 0 now how could I prove that a parametric curve is going to like loop around and intersect itself somewhere well what should be happening at a point of intersection right if, if we've got just some function out there in space and it chooses to intersect itself at some time it's a parametrically defined curve so I got to put my arrows on it right and so if this parametrically defined curve, you know, we could find slopes on this thing wherever we want, right? So there's a slope, it seems unique. There's a slope, it seems unique. There's a slope, it seems unique. All these slopes can be found at certain times, but notice that at a point of intersection, it seems like there are two distinct tangent lines that could be associated with the curve at one location. That's weird. You've never seen a situation ever in which there are two distinct tangent lines at a single point because you so far have only ever studied actual functions, right? Where we pass the vertical line test. Since our parametric equations don't, they can intersect each other. And we can prove that an intersection occurs at a point without just looking at a graph by showing that there must be two different slopes that we could identify at a single point on the graph, right? Because they're doing a little bit of this. We're finding this slope and we're finding this slope right here. So one way to prove that a parametric curve intersects itself is to show that it has a point at which there are two distinct unique derivatives at that location. So what I'm thinking we should do here is let's find the general derivative and then evaluate it at the time t of interest. So what I want to know is I want to know the slope of this curve, which is dy dx. Unfortunately, I don't directly right now have a way to just take the derivative of y with respect to x, because y is currently a function of t, not a function of x. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do dy dt divided by dx dt. And these are both easy to do. dy dt is 3t squared minus 3. dx dt looks like it's just 2t right there. So I think I can do a simple little uh, simplification here and just call this 3 halves t minus, uh, I guess, 3 halves times 1 over t. And uh, I suppose they both have a factor of 3 halves. Might as well factor that out. 3 halves t minus 1 over t. Looks like this is my general dy dx expression right there. So I found the general derivative. Um, so now we want to be able to, I want to evaluate this at the time of interest. But we only know the location of interest. So what we need to do is we need to solve for what time are we searching for, given that we know the location here. So one thing I could do is I could say, listen, I know that my x location of interest is 3. And I also know that x of t is going to be equal to t squared. right? That's how we defined x of t way up at the top right there. So it seems to me like we should be able to make the pretty simple statement that says 3 equals t squared. And we can very easily solve that to get that. We must be looking at time positive or negative root 3 right there. Uh, now, um, so it seems like there's two times at which we visited that point, And that makes sense here, right? This could be maybe, for example, that our curve may be like, according to the picture I've drawn, which isn't totally accurate right here relative to our, this is just a generic picture, not necessarily meant to imitate that actual diagram there. You should notice in this picture, maybe it's the case that like we started right there and we could either go forwards in time by root three to get there or backwards in time by root three to get to that same location right there. This would be like the, and again, this graph is not these functions right there necessarily, but if it were, I would be thinking of some point that's symmetrically on either side of the point of intersection that's right there um, for, for our starting point right there. Now, alternatively, what we could have done right here is we could have played the same game, but with our y values, right? Um, I'm going to say here, or what we could have done is we could have said, listen, I know that our location of interest happens at y equals 0, and I know that y of t is equal to t cubed minus 3t. So that tells me I can just say that 0 equals t cubed minus 3t, which is clearly equal to t times t squared minus 3, which tells me that t is equal to 0 or plus or minus root 3. 
I'm noticing that time t equals zero seems to be when y is equal to zero, but it doesn't seem to be when x is equal to three. So I'm gonna say at time equals zero, y equals zero, but x does not equal three. So only time equals plus or minus root three. So I checked them and it was kind of important to check both right here, just because it, it clearly we got, you know, here we're gonna get all the, all the locations on the parametric curve where y was equal to zero. That doesn't necessarily only coincide with the places that x, or sorry, where y was equal to zero. That doesn't necessarily only coincide where x is equal to three. We wanted both those things to be true right there. Um, so I did have to kind of double check both, but it does look like time being plus or minus three seems to be uh, the, the times at which we reach that location. So we're at location three, zero at times t equals plus or minus root three. Um, and so now I can go ahead and evaluate my dy dx at each of those times because dy dx is currently a function of t, so I need to be evaluating it at times t. Uh, we found that dy dx was this 3 halves t minus 1 over t. So we're going to get 3 halves negative root 3 minus 1 over negative root 3. Uh, and I don't know how, how much I care to meaningfully uh, alter this evaluation. I think I can at least write this as 3 halves um, 1 over root 3 minus root 3. So there's one of them right there. And I'm noticing real quickly here, 1 divided by root 3 is clearly a number less than 1. Square root of 3 is clearly a number greater than 1. And so this is a negative slope right here. Uh, alternatively, we could do dy dx and evaluate it at time positive 3. And that's just going to give us another very similar looking statement right here. So what we found was that there were two different times at which we arrived at one location, and we were able to show that the slope at those two locations, at that same location at two different times, was different at which we were passing through that location right there. Um, so it looks like we did verify that there were two unique slopes at a location, um, which isn't something that can otherwise happen when we have functions, not parametric equations, right? Now, <clears throat> a thing that you should sort of be asking yourself is, why did we have to go into t for all of this business? What we really just wanted was dy dx. So my question to you is, could we have just solved for y to be in terms of x here? Couldn't we have just solved for y equals f of x? Uh, it turns out in this case that the answer is yes. And my question is, what did we look like if, if we were to have done that? So we had the equations of what? x equals t squared y equals t cubed minus 3t. Well, we want y in terms of x, so I'm just thinking to myself, let's solve for uh, t here, and you should notice a very important thing happens here. That plus or minus is kind of our, our critical component to this whole deal right here. So let's go ahead and throw this into our y equations here. I've either got that t is going to be positive root x, in which case here I've got y equals root x cubed minus 3 root x. Alternatively, we've got t equals negative root x. That's the other times that are available to us. And here, y is going to be negative root x cubed plus 3 root x right there. Um, so it seems like this is our good descriptor of our curve when the times are greater than 0. And this is when our times are less than zero. So in this case right here, we could have come up with two functions of x, but because there's two functions of x for two different groupings of times, it is possible then that we're going to evaluate these derivatives, plural, of y with respect to x <coughs> to identify two different slopes that we're going to arrive at. So the answer is yes in this case. And I, as you guys know, I often pick problems that are simple enough that they can be done both ways so that we can show that we get the same results regardless of how we approach it. Let's take a moment real quick here, by the way, to go and check out what this guy actually does look like in Desmos so that we can see if this stuff is going to happen right here. <coughs> um, so if we pop over to Desmos real quick here, our equations that we were interested in are x being t squared, y being t cubed minus uh, 3t. <coughs> Goodness gracious. 
Um, so uh, remember that when we graph these things in Desmos, we just want to graph things as like x comma y. Well, in our case, x was t squared and y was t cubed minus 3t. <clears throat> and you can see this is giving us some chunk of curve right here. In general, I just like to expand this so that it gives us a lot of stuff that's visible. You know, just make that go further out there. Um, as we did in the last class, I do think it's useful to do this in something other than T, get a more generic or a parameter out there. So that Desmos will give us a dot that we can graph then. I'm going to add the slider for A. It's going from negative 10 to 10, so whatever. The point here is that I can now go ahead and slide this thing around. And actually, this, this image looks similar to what I was thinking about before, which is that at time zero, we're at zero. We're, we're symmetric on either sides of something where we can either go forwards in time and get to, and that number right there is about the square root of three. 1.7 is ballpark square root of three. Or we could go backwards in time to get to that square root of three. You can clearly see, see that we're passing through this point with a positive slope during positive time. You can clearly see that we're passing through this point with negative slope in negative time over here as well. So all this stuff completely agrees with exactly what we just saw um, in that thing right there. So I might as well go ahead and share this Desmos link into our notes right here. And there's our, our Desmos graph of that guy right there. Hey, why'd that stop being a link? Keep being a link. Okay, so that's in the notes right there. Now that Desmos link right there. So there we go. So we, we computed the derivative. We evaluated the derivative at some times. Remember that here we were given the location of interest, but not the time of interest. So we had to solve for the times that were associated with a given location. I wasn't terribly surprised to find two different times because I was anticipating getting two different slopes uh, through that single point that was right there. So that stuff all kind of seemed to like come together really nicely right there. Everything I expected to happen did happen right there. So <clears throat> derivatives, not super exciting. Integrals, a little bit more exciting right here. So what we want to do now is update how we think about integrals. And this is really easy as long as we're okay with doing that same don't you just trust that you can do it all the time? But as long as we treat our derivatives as if they were fractions that can be manipulated, a lot of these things, if you kind of like gloss over the deeper details of these things, it's pretty easy to justify our newer formulas that are related to these. Um, so in general, our most generic integral looks like this, you know, integral of f of x dx. This is the most generic way that I could write an integral. And we're remembering that when we write this, we really mean that f of x is y stuff, right? Because what I'm picturing when I say y times dx that equals the area of a Riemann stick, right? That has a height of y and a width of infinitely thin width of dx right there. So that's why I kind of, although this is kind of my most generic integral representation with the f of x, I really do like to think about it as the y because this tells me the information of height times width. That's saying literally add up a bunch of rectangles. So all we're going to do to <clears throat> get our new format for integrals of parametric functions that aren't in uh, true function format here is make two little substitutions. One is that I need to be replacing. So what we're going to do is we're really going to work with this integral for the replacements right here. I'm going to let y just be what we've been calling it today. We've said that, um, remember we said that x is f of t and that y is g of t. Well, one, the simple thing I'm going to do with my y is I'm just going to remind myself, oh yeah, y is g of t. So that says to me when I go to write my integral expression in a minute, I'm just going to have a g of t sitting right there. What's going to happen to the dx component? Well, to get my dx component swapped out, I'm going to start with the statement that dx dt is clearly equal to dx dt, right? So this is sort of my initializing statement right here. And what I would like is a statement for what is dx equal to. So I'm going to do the, the hokey math that you should not in general trust that you can do, but is correct in this instance right here, which is I'm going to multiply this dt over to the other side to get our replacement equation here that dx is dx dt dt. So we're now going to get an integral in terms of dt that once was in terms of dx. And you should notice that this introduces an extra little component here, dx dt. Well, if I want a better way to write dx dt, I know that we defined x as f of t. So dx dt is just f prime of t, right? So this is my replacement. So this is, this is almost just like we're doing a u sub here in a sense. This should feel to you like a u sub. So all I'm getting now is we are replacing, right? We're getting our integral from a to b of y dx. Well, this is our y right here. 
and this is our dx right there. I just replaced the two parts. Alpha and beta are our slightly more generic endpoints right there. I'm not describing them super well right now on purpose. Sometimes you're going to see that alpha and beta are, and I'm going to scroll up for a minute. Sometimes you're going to see that alpha and beta are times because that's the variable that's actually of interest. But what's often very, very common here is to talk about locations in space. So you will also occasionally see these integrals written with locations, like ordered pairs, like three, zero. And it might be the case that you might need to convert location information into time information or vice versa with these setups right there. So alpha and beta I'm leaving as generic. Sometimes they're times, sometimes they're xy coordinate pairs. As long as it's enough information for us to know uh, where we're evaluating from, we can manage to, to do the problem. So I'm saying initial and final points. Um, and I'm going to just cross that out and say locations or times. And it'll be up to us to judge what's going to be the most practical thing for us to have right there. So we now know how to express an integral, right, which can help us find some area underneath the curve if our curve is defined parametrically rather than being defined uh, as a function y equals f of x. All we need to know is the y of equation and the x equation. Apparently, we're taking the derivative of the x equation and then doing an integral dt right there. So let's use parametric equations to find the area of a circle. You guys know I love doing our geometry problems that just justify previously known results here. Um, so let's say what we know the answer is going to be. We know that if a circle has radius 1, we should be getting pi for our answer is basically what I'm saying right here. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to find the area of a unit circle and I know what the answer is. The answer should be pi that we're going to get right here. It's always good to do your first problem with a problem that you already know the answer to so that you can just confirm that you're getting things correct right here. Now, um, the reason that I really like this problem is because I haven't told you what our parameterization is. You need to know it right here. And this is, like I said in the last video, if there's one thing that you remember about parametric functions, it's how to parameterize a circle. That's uh, I, I would argue that that is probably going to be the most practical thing. Uh, if, there, if there was one thing to remember about parametric equations, you should be able to parameterize a circle. Let's do that. So parameterization of a circle. Parameterization of a circle. And remember that we kind of have lots of choices. It's basically any combination of sine and cosine right here. I think the one that we did in the last class, I think it's very typical or for me, I always like to think of my X being my cosine stuff because we remember from polar stuff, which by the way, if you look above my head, we're doing polar, just this is parametric week is this week, polar week is next week. We're gonna do kind of all the same stuff, but in polar again next week. For my polar conversions, I always think to myself, x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. So I typically associate my x's with my cosine stuff right here. Since we're doing a unit circle, where you get a coefficient of 1 right there for the radius term. So my, uh, oh, and by the way, sorry, I'm going to I'm gonna try and be consistent with my notation. I'm writing like x of t and y of t. I'm going to write x equals uh, f of t equals cosine of t and y equals g of t equals sine of t. And so one of the things that I remember about my parameterization of a circle is that it can actually go down like tons of different ways. You could use positives, negatives, sines, cosines, doesn't matter because the square of one plus the square of the other is going to be equal to one. That's going to define our circle. Whether we do positives, negatives, switch them, doesn't matter. Um, so I want to know to my, I want to kind of ask myself, hey, wait a minute. Which of the versions of the parameterization did I just come up with? I know the shape is a circle. I don't know where we start or in what direction we go. So I kind of want to ask myself, um, so what direction and where do we start? So let's kind of draw a little bit of a diagram right here. And notice that this is going to be important because we need to identify our alpha and our beta, our starting and our final location right here. So what I'm thinking to myself here is f of 0 is cosine of 0, which is 1, which is x. And g of 0 is sine of 0, which is 0, which is y. And so it looks like we're starting at 1, 0 right there. I can see that at time um, 
times zero. That's where we're at right there. Uh, and then I always ask myself, I don't want to do like pi or two pi right there because those are going to be really uh, overly nicely symmetric. So I'll then look at pi halves right here. F of pi halves is cosine of pi halves, which is zero, which is x. And g of pi halves is sine of pi halves which is one, which is y. So it looks like this is our time zero. I'll go ahead and I'll call this alpha. And it seems like we just found that this is our final time right there. So I'll go ahead and call that guy beta right there. And this is t equals zero. This is t equals pi halves. So I now know what direction we have parameterized the circle. It looks like we're going in the counterclockwise direction. Um, so what I'm thinking to myself is, as we often do, especially when we're talking about circles, is it seems like what we have described from the zero to the pi halves, that covers one fourth of the circle. So it seems like we can probably set up an integral here that just covers the first quadrant, multiply the whole thing by four, and I think we'll be good to go. Um, so it seems to me like I sh could now be stating for myself here um, that our area is going to be equal to four times the integral. And, I, uh, and I'm just going to generically state this as alpha and beta for right now, alpha and beta, as we've defined them in the picture right there. And we just came up with our formula one second ago. Our formula for our integral is g of t times f prime of t dt. g of t, f prime of t dt. And again, we're doing four because this integral really just represents only the first quadrant. So we're multiplying by 4. Just getting circle symmetry stuff going on right here. So let's do the dang thing here. What do we get? 4 times the integral. And again, I'm I'm being lazy with my bounds of integration right here because I'm just going to deal with those in a minute. I want to set up what's going on in my integrand here first. So g of t is our sine of t. f prime of t is the derivative of cosine. So that's negative sine dt. So what does it look like we're getting? It looks like we're getting negative 4 integral from alpha to beta of sine squared of t dt. And so now, don't worry, we're back in your favorite place to be this semester, trig land once again. Um, so what are we doing with this guy now? Um, you guys kind of hopefully remember our moves with this one right here, where we say that sine squared of t is equal to 1 minus cosine squared of t. Um, and then cosine squared of t, we can rewrite using our half angle identities here. So let me bring back up our, that, this. Okay, sorry, I lied, I lied. That's what I was thinking to myself, I, I'm, I'm, I'm miss, um, I'm misleading myself slightly here. I'm looking over here at our formula sheet, and the one that I'm remembering that I want to use here is I'm looking to evaluate sine squared uh, because I can't directly do an antiderivative for sine squared. But I'm seeing here, this is involved with a double angle formula for cosine right here. So this is what I think I'm gonna wanna be replacing it with right here. Cosine of 2t is one minus two sine squared of t. So I, I, was, I was going into my Pythagorean identities right here, I wanna back out of that idea use that identity right here. So let me come back over here and erase that previous line that I just wrote and fix it with the thing I actually want to use right here. So let me so cosine of 2t is 1 minus 2 sine squared of t. Let me double check. Did I get that correct? 1 minus 2 sine squared is cosine of 2 theta. And so this is going to help me rewrite this now. So it looks like cosine of 2t minus 1 is negative 2 sine squared of t. And we divide everything by negative 2. And that's going to give me 1 half minus 1 half cosine of 2t equals sine squared of t. But I'm not kind of eyeballing these constants out front right here right away because I know that I've got a 4 sitting out front. So I think I'm going to 
do this for myself right here. So there's my sine squared of t representation for my identities right there. So now let's go back into our, our integrand right here. Um, I'm going to get this negative 4 times 1 half. That 1 half that's right there is that 1 half that's right there. Integral from alpha to beta of 1 minus cosine of 2t. This is something I can directly integrate right here. So it looks like I'm getting a negative 2 integral from alpha to beta of uh, 1 minus cosine 2t, and now we can integrate. I just want to simplify that, that constant sitting out front right there. So I'm integrating with respect to t, so I'm going to get negative 2 times t. Now the integral of the cosine function is going to be the sine function, so I'm going to get a minus 1 half sine of 2t. We should stop for a moment and take our derivative and check that this is true. The derivative of sine is cosine, and so our sines still match. The times the derivative of the inside function, which is 2, which cancels out with the 1 half. So I'm pretty happy with this 1 half sine of 2t right here. Uh, we know that we need to evaluate this from t equals alpha to t equals beta. And what were times alpha and beta here? Well, I'm looking back up at my picture. It seems like alpha was time zero and beta was time pi halves. So it looks like these are our choices from the diagram up above. So that was zero, and this is pi halves right there. Um, so I think we can do this. Negative two times, I'm going to plug in pi halves. Notice that two times pi halves is just pi minus. 0 minus 1 half sine of 0. Well, that didn't do anything for us there, did it? And to wrap up our evaluation, uh, looks like I'm getting here negative 2 times. Now, sine of pi, that's just going to be 0 because our height is 0 at pi. So I'm getting negative 2 times pi halves, and that's giving me negative pi. super close so close couldn't be much closer without being right obviously we were looking for the answer of positive pi what just happened right there we got the negative of the correct answer why did we get the negative of the correct answer because our starting location alpha was to the right of our ending location beta we know that when we integrate from right to left we get the negative of the result as if we integrated from left to right because our delta x term is negative if we're going from right to left it's positive if we're going from left to right. Um, so we have our, so we have a lesson here. Always, whatever, however you pick your points, let alpha be the one that you call your endmost point right there. Um, our, our integration rule that we all learned back in chapter five was that the integral of f of x dx from a to b is equal to negative of the integral from b to a, f of x dx. When we integrate from uh, right to left, our delta x is negative. When we go left to right, our change in x value is always positive. So that's just where that negative gets introduced from is from that delta x term that's sitting right there. So this is just saying, this is just a natural issue that arises with uh, integration in general. It's not really an issue. It's just a, a thing to observe right there. Um, so your general lesson is let alpha be your leftmost endpoint. Just like in your super basic integrals, you always want a to be smaller than b. We want alpha to be more to the left than beta if we're going to get the, the, the correct sign on our areas that we're interested in right there. So this is just saying we do everything right. We just sort of set up our bounds of integration slightly backwards to what they probably should have been right there. Cool. So we can do some area calculations right here. We just found area of a circle by a parametric definition of a circle rather than a function definition of a circle. And remember, the function definition of a circle is hard also. y equals square to 1 minus x squared. We like literally had to learn all of our trig substitutions just to handle area of a circle before. Area of a circle is one of those things where it's not super hard, but like there's no super clean way to get at it right here. These have been challenging in both directions uh, that we've done this. So, so there we go. So let's talk arc length our next kind of topic. We've done derivatives and tangent lines. We've done general integrals. Now let's talk about how we're going to modify what we've seen from arc length. And the good news here is that we're just going to swap out with some, some of our differential terms here. So before with y equals f of x, 
we had that our arc length was equal to the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. That's a dy dx sitting right there. Man, that looks terrible. I'm going to erase that and draw it so it's actually legible since it's the most important term in the equation. dy dx. There we go. Now we can actually see it. So all we want to do is swap out some differential terms that we've already seen how to do. Right? Uh, the two things that need to go is we need to swap out dy dx. We've already seen a way to rewrite this. This is dy dt over dx dt. The other thing we need to swap out is dx, which we have already done as dx dt dt. So both of those are, are swaps that we've already made in the last 20 minutes right here. We're just doing them again, right? So now we have arc length is our integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus dy dt dx dt squared. So I replace dy dx with its complex fraction. dx is getting swapped out for dx dt dt. All right. So we just want to simplify this thing. This just looks terrible right now. I don't want to actually use it in this form. So here's what I'm going to do. I hate complex fractions. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to factor out this denominator, this 1 over dx dt squared from this uh, term right here. So when I factor out 1 over dx dt squared from 1, that leaves me with just a dx dt squared. Plus, I factored out the denominator from this fraction, so that should just leave me with a dy dt squared dx dt dt. And now you should notice that this 1 over dx dt squared, I can pop this out as a squared term from the square root, and 1 over dx dt is going to cancel with dx dt. And that's going to leave us with a really clean looking expression here. The integral of the sum of the squares of dx dt and dy dt. So that was actually really cool right there. Um, and in general, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to replace our A and B, since those are kind of holdovers from the previous statement, as our general alphas and betas that, again, might be points, kind of should be times, but are sometimes given to you as locations in space right there. So this is now our new arc length formula for parametric equations. So in this problem here that we're going to do our little example that we'll do, um, what I want to do is I want to look at a curve that we could not talk about the arc length of if we weren't in parametric form. So what I want to do is I want to find the entire length of the forwards time spiral defined by these two curves right here. So let's talk about this for a minute. Let's go to Desmos and look, and then we'll go ahead and do some computation. So first things first, when I see this equation, the first thing that's kind of smacking me in the face right now is I'm saying, holy cow, this looks like x is basically cosine and y is basically sine. This is a circle, is what I'm saying to myself right now. But why is this slightly not a circle? Well, this would just be straight up a circle if that term right there was just like the number 4 or the number 5 or the number 1 if it's a unit circle, right? And similarly right over here. So it seems like what's going on is this looks like the parameterization of a circle, except in the radius slot, we actually have a function of t that is an exponential decay function, saying it seems like the radius is decaying over time. So I'm going to say this here. looks a lot like the parameterization of a circle.
but instead of a constant radius, our radius is decaying exponentially over time. That is exactly how you should think of a spiral. All right. Spirals are basically circles where the radius is just getting smaller, or I guess you could be a spiral growing out and your radius is getting bigger over time right there. So one thing I want to say is this makes a ton of sense to me that we're thinking about spirals in this case because it feels like we're looking at a circle, but a circle where the radius is actually changing, and that's going to give us a spiral. Um, because in the radius slot, we actually have a whole function of t instead of a constant radius that's right there. The other thing here is that when I talk about a forwards time spiral, that really says to me that time is going to be just looking at po all positive time, forwards time. We're not talking about negative times. We're starting at time zero. And I want to know the entire length, so for all time. So let's let t go off to infinity here. So um, let's go ahead and take a gander at what this is going to look like in Desmos before we go ahead and do this. Um, so if I pop over here to Desmos, we're looking at uh, e to the negative t. Now, by the way, I'm going to I'm going to modify this ever so slightly so that this is more visually satisfying for us. Um, And what I want to do is I want to extend our time here. And so here's the whole dang thing. It's all right there. And what you should see is that as we zoom in, it's actually doing that spiraling. It's just spiraling so hard in towards the origin that it's really hard for you to see it when we're zoomed out. But like, I hope that you're very convinced that this is in fact a spiral right here. What I'm going to do to make this visually slightly more appealing is I'm going to dan I'm going to soften how quickly we're decaying, and let's make this like a 0.1, and like a 0.1 right there. And now it maybe looks more like that spiral. We're just if we let the radius decay slightly less fast. Then, then we're getting something that's a little bit more visually like that spiral that we're going to see right there. So this is what's happening. Our radius is just going to zero much, much quicker. So it didn't look like a spiral at a glance to you until we zoomed in because this one has a slowly decaying radius. You're seeing that radius very slowly decay over time as we spiral inwards. So in a sense, aside from these point ones that I have artificially introduced here, our goal is to find the entire length of this infinitely long spiral. But now the things that are hopefully kind of obvious to you is that as the radius decays more and more and more, we're like not really traveling very far. So it's not like we're accumulating massive amounts of arc length here, right? I mean, uh, I feel like most of the length that we've got is in, in these outermost bands that we've got right there. Um, how much length could we really be accumulating in the middle? That's sort of a, a trick question right there, but only in anticipation of chapter 11, I think super particular about this problem. So uh, I'm gonna get rid of those point ones right there. And again, this is a spiral. It's just aggressively spiraling. So when we're zoomed out, you don't quite see it very much. But there we go. We've seen the spiral there. So let's pop back over to Microsoft Word and let's do this dang thing right here. So I want to know the entire length of that entire spiral starting at one zero. Where does it end up? So it's going to spiral in forever, right? Um, so let's go ahead and find the length of that overall spiral right there. Now we've just been uh, we just came up with this uh, formula here. And man, this formula is so nice. dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. That's like couldn't have really hope for that to have come out much nicer right there. I don't think. Um, and so what what exactly are our alpha and beta right here? Well, it looks like for us here. Alpha is zero. Well, hold on. let me write it like this. This is location one zero or time zero. 
Where is beta? Well, where are we going to end up? Well, we're going to end up pretty obviously at zero, zero, because as time gets infinitely large, it's very clear that I don't care where you're at in your cosine or sine cycle, our, our coefficient out front is going to be infinitely small. So that's going to tend down towards zero, zero. Um, or, uh, and I'll put this in quotes, t equals infinity, since infinity is not something you'd be equal to, so that's why it gets the little quotations right there. Um, so let's go ahead and see if we can kind of figure this guy out here. So. Here's kind of what I'm seeing. What I know that I'm going to have to do right now is I need to take the derivative of both x and y with respect to t, and then I need to square them. And I, I hope it's pretty obvious to you that we're going to need to like do some kind of major algebraic, hopeful simplification underneath the square root so we can deal with this quantity here. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of side work with this one, I think. Um, so let's go ahead and do our dx dt. And that should be the derivative with respect to t of x, which is e to the negative t cosine of t. And that is going to give us the derivative of the first term is negative e to the negative t, leave the second term alone, cosine of t, plus the leave the first term alone, and take the derivative of the second term. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of t. Um, and so it looks like here both terms have a negative. Both terms have an e to the negative t. So I'm going to factor out that negative e to the negative t. And that leaves me with cosine t plus sine t. Now let's do the exact same thing. The only difference is that the y equation has sine in it instead of cosine. So my dy dt term, that's the derivative with respect to t of e to the negative t sine of t. And very, very, very similarly, negative e to the negative t sine t plus e to the negative t cos t. You should notice the only real distinction is we didn't get a negative in that second term right there. Uh, so I'm only going to factor out a positive e to the negative t from this guy right here. That is going to leave me with a positive cosine of t and a negative sine of t. All right. So I think we're, I guess, I mean, I guess ready to throw these parts in here. Um, so we're going to get that our arc length is going to be integral from alpha to beta. I'm going to, I'm going to write these as the bounds that we now know that they are. Um, integral from time zero to time infinity right there um, of the square root of we've got negative e to the negative t cos t plus sine t squared as promised we're going to need to do some simplification here e to the negative t cos t minus sine t squared dt so Here's some things that I'm seeing. One, when we square these things, this is a number times a number getting squared, so we're individually squaring the exponentials and the trig parts separately, right? So one thing I'm going to get here is the square of negative e to the negative t. Well, that's going to be e to the negative 2t. And what are we multiplying it by? Well, the square of cos t sine t. So that's going to be cosine squared of t plus 2 sine t cos t plus sine squared of t plus here we're going to get e to the negative 2t again because I'm squaring e to the negative t and here we're going to get cosine squared of t minus 2 sine t cos t plus sine squared of t So what the heck are we getting here? Well, here's the things that I'm seeing. One, e to the negative 2t, common to both. I'm going to factor it out, and that's going to give me an e to the negative t outside of the square root right here, right? So e to the negative 2t, e to the negative 2t, both a factor. The square root of e to the negative 2t, you're just dividing the power by 2 to get e to the negative 1t. So that's outside the square root now. Inside the square root, what do we got? Well, clearly here, cosine of t and sine of t are going to come together to give us 1. Cosine of t and sine of t are going to come together to give us 1 again. And I'm also going to be left with a 2 sine t. I'll get some purple here. 2 sine t and negative 2 sine t. Looks like those are just going to cancel with each other. Wow. Wow. 
that worked out pretty dang nice cool let's go ahead and wrap this guy up then so what are we going to end up getting here so okay up, up, up. get it get out of here sir sir i'm not ready for you so let's go ahead and do the integration right here um it looks like we're really getting here you know root 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of just e to the negative t dt um, that's going to give me square root of 2 um, times negative e to the negative t uh, okay 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 I need I need to get my limit statement in here now okay 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 limit as b goes to infinity of negative e to the negative t evaluated from t equals zero to t equals b being 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 a responsible with my limit bounds here so that's root two and by the way i'm going to pull out this negative as well right there that's a negative it's getting pulled out here i'm going to get my uh limit as b goes to infinity of this is going to be e to the negative b minus e to the negative zero right upper minus lower right there the negative that was sitting right there i'm just going to draw my little line for it right here there's my negative right there um and now as i evaluate my limit as b gets infinitely large we're taking e to the negative infinity power that's going to zero so it looks like we're getting negative root two times zero minus one we're getting root two so although that spiral spirals forever for all time its length is a grand total of the square root of two and that's it which is kind of crazy in fact that's really crazy i don't think it's any more crazy than the arc length uh, results that we got when we covered the arc length section right there um and 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 i want to encourage you to have your mind blown by infinity and how it ends up not being so infinite as it seems sometimes uh, that's going to be a major theme of our chapter 11 coming up here um but really cool problem right here so we just found the um the length of a spiral that spirals for infinite time and we found it to be not just a finite value but a small finite value here um so pretty cool problem right there i like this one a lot so finally surface area surface area is going to follow the exact same maneuvers that we already did if you remember our surface area formula our surface area formula looked like surface area equals and what did we get we got the integral from a to b of 2 pi r times arc length All right that was like how we built this thing before well that's exactly what we're going to get here um this time now so I'm just gonna say before our general version now what are we gonna get well we're gonna get the same thing right here I'm just gonna write it two different way or I'm not even gonna write it two different ways here um, surface area equals the integral from alpha to beta uh, I'm still gonna write this as 2 pi r for right now um, but I'm gonna suggest what that r value should be right there in a moment um, and this is just going to be times our square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt where r equals y equals g of t if we rotate about the x-axis and r equals x equals f of t if we rotate about the y-axis now what you guys learned in our arc length versus surface area sections before is that surface area didn't really introduce to us any new ideas it did give us a new formula but the bulk of this formula is fully dependent on us having previously understood the arc length thing so this is where i'm just going to say i don't think i need to do a surface area of a volume of revolution and parametric form problem right now uh, we basically just did all the exciting action of it in the arc length problem that we did right here the only thing that's exciting is you're going to multiply by an additional two 
times pi times one of your two parametric functions right there for the radius term as well. It obviously might end up being a difficult integral, but this section is not about difficult integrals. This, this section is about the conceptual uh, relationships between parametric functions and our desired integration quantities here. Um, so sure, this might lead to some hard integrals just like it did in the previous section out there, um, but conceptually speaking, really easy for us to build our surface area of a volume of uh, revolution formula for this guy. So this is basically my long way of saying I'm not going to do an example right now we just did the exciting example with our arc length example right here and boy was it exciting uh, so in my mind that is good right there so um, what I'm thinking to myself is I'm not certain that I'm ever gonna make another video underneath an hour I'm looking at my time right now I'm at 59 minutes and 40 seconds which means I'm gonna go ahead and call it right now next week is going to be just like this week except we're doing polar uh, form instead of parametric form of our equations. After next week, we're covering chapter 11 for the rest of this class. I will see you guys for Polar in week 12. Have a good one, everybody.